Good morning again. We are zipping right along here. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. We went to chapel one day, my first year of Bible college, not very far in. And, you know, I went there, I was an older guy, and you had a bunch of people that already knew each other. A bunch of them went to high school together, and went, they started college together. And we used to have to lead singing. And we'd have to do chapel for the week. We had chapel three days a week. And I was scared to death. I was already leading singing, but in a little house church. And I didn't really want to lead singing, but we ended up having to. My day, it was the first week of a class from Pastor Carter. And I was almost late that day. And it was just one of those days, you know. So I did uh, my song leading. And then after my turn, being up in the front of the alphabet, they quit. They didn't do it anymore. So I thought, man, that stinks. Well, I was reading something yesterday, an email I get, and it was uh, talking about a quote from the philosopher Seneca. And it said, when trouble comes knocking, let it find you home. Well, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? It's a very interesting thought. It's just going to be what it be. Let it find you. You're better off to let it find you home than you are to put it off, right? So then, not long after that, we had a chapel where I assumed the preacher didn't show up, right? <clears throat> so what they were going to do, we had five minutes to preach. And there was a guy in front of me named Baron Brown. So they called him and they gave him a topic. And as soon as he got to the pulpit... We had five minutes to preach. They said, Brother Campbell, you're next. Your word is grace. And I thought, wow, how easy is that going to be? Amen. That's, that's the easiest word in the scripture to preach on, right? So, so I preached uh, from this verse that we're going to get to. We're going to start in verse 8, but verse 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so that's what I ended up preaching that morning. And... We ended up having a good time that day. It was like, you know, you'd been let off after you're done. You're really nervous until you get up there, and then you kind of settle in for a few minutes, and then you're done. You know, you've been reprieved from that point. And um, so I was able, as a result of that, I got to preach in some chapel. I preached a, you know, like a whole chapel message. We had an invitation, the whole deal. It was a lot of fun. And it was, it was quite an honor, you know, my pastor and his wife came, my wife came, my mom came, I think. But uh, we ended up having a really nice time. And um, Memories, that's what happens when we get old, right? We have a lot of memories. And I had some the other day. I, it's funny, I was in Fashion Square Mall on Friday. And the way I always went in, you go in, you take a left into the main alt mall area, you know. And I looked around and I thought, this place is a ghost town. There's like one shop out of five actually has something in them, you know. And to me, that's sad, you know what I mean? Because that Fashion Square Mall had a big place in my growing up, you know. That's where we went, Christmas shopping, all that stuff. And so it's, it's sad to see those things go by the wayside when it's part of your growing up. But no matter where we are in this life, and almost everybody here today would claim to be saved, the only ones that wouldn't claim to be saved would be very young. Amen? So there's part of this message that maybe we can just change and we can celebrate this thing together. Be beginning in verse 8, the Bible says, speaking about the resurrection of Jesus, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. 
by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul talks about the idea that the gospel is made up of how Christ died, that he was, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he goes into the proofs, the evidence, eyewitness testimony after the resurrection that Jesus Christ was indeed resurrected. And he talks about the idea that he's not really, it's not meet for him to even be called an apostle because he's the least of all the apostles as is if one born out of due time, which is how he refers to himself in, in more than one place. But then he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Meaning it is purely the grace of God that I am this one who scripture is being recorded about, that I'm writing scripture. I'm the one by the grace of God who the, the, the mystery of the one body made up of Jew and Gentile is given to reveal to the, word in the, to the world in the New Testament of scripture. But he says something very interesting here. He says, And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Do you imagine receiving the grace of God in vain? I've said many times, the Bible, uh, we're told historically that on American shores that the first great awakening was begun by the preaching of Jonathan Edwards, where he preached from Deuteronomy, the Bible says, and in due time their foot shall slip. And we're told that in that hall, which was packed to overflowing that night, that Jonathan Edwards, by candlelight, read a manuscript, and people were put under such conviction that they were holding on to the pews and holding on to the pillars of the building for fear that their feet would slip even then and they would plunge into hell. Boy, wouldn't it be good to be in on a little bit of that kind of the power of God where the conviction could be that strong that we, we are so now that we, we judge different styles and different ways of preaching and whether somebody was able to carry off the message that they had begun by picking it up, right? The same thing can be said about singers sometimes, you know, you can pick up a song that you can't carry off. Um, better to be simple and to hit all the notes than to try to get elaborate and show yourself unequal to it, if you will. But wouldn't it be great that if the power of God could show up? And one of my friends on Facebook posted uh, last Saturday night, I believe it was, um, you know, the job that your preacher does tomorrow depends on your, pre your praying tonight. Tremendous thought. That's not verbatim, but that was the, the gist of the message. And the message that Jonathan Edwards preached back then in the late 1700s was bathed in prayer both by himself and by many crying out uh, to God that he might grant revival in the midst of the wickedness of the United States of America after the war for independence, right? That's what it was, by the way. It wasn't a revolutionary war. It was a war for independence, Amen. Just like that war in the 1860s, that was the war of northern aggression, right? You have to, you got to title these things the right way. We're having a little fun there. But, but it was the war for independence, and America had been granted independence, and they had given credit to God, just like their forefathers, the pilgrims who had come over. And, and even though almost all of them died in that first year, they had that Thanksgiving feast, and and they had that time with the native peoples and those things. And they gave God praise as if they were the people of Israel wandering in the desert to find their way to these American shores. And they're established a nation built upon the principles of the word of God, which give the freedom to worship God according to the dictates of your own conscience. You think about that power. 
There have been three great awakenings in, in the history of the United States of America, but we've gone a long time waiting on the fourth. We're even now beginning to predict that there will be no fourth, right? If there is any revival to be had, it will be local at best, and it will have to be personal revival at first, and, and we all need that, right? I was told a story of a mountain preacher one time at what they used to call the Spencer Church in mailing address Sissonville, West Virginia, but it's on Grapevine. It was, it was after you take the left hand at the fork and long after you had turned on to the two-track gravel road to get up in the holler. You were just below the last turn going up the hill to what they call the head of the holler. Amen. The old Spencer Church there. And fella asked a mess, asked the congregation one day, he said, Who here is as close to God as you want to be? And nobody raised their hand and and finally, my grandfather, Lewis E. Campbell, raised his hand, and the preacher said, Brother Campbell, why don't you stand and tell us what you mean? He said, Preacher, every single one of us is as close to God as we want to be. And that's the truth. It's a matter of want to. It, it's a matter of intent plus application, right? There has to be more than some vague or esoteric idea that I would love to be closer to God. I'll give you a few pointers. You want to be close to God? Read your Bible and study your Bible. I've been praying for the last few weeks about what God would have me study. Sometimes I study a New Testament book and an Old Testament book. And I finished up. I got up the other morning at 4 o'clock. I'd already been up a couple uh, hour and a half, and I decided I'm not going to sleep, so I'm going to get up and read my Bible. It was the last day of September, and I decided I was going to start the book of Revelation that day and finish, and I decided, okay, today's the last day of September. I'm going to read the whole book of Revelation, then I'm going to get into my, finish my Psalms reading for the year, read the book of Proverbs every month, and I said, I'm, I'm going to pray and ask the Lord what he'd have me to do. And this is the morning I really do need to decide. So I read the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation, read Psalms and Proverbs, and I prayed and asked the Lord, and he said, Revelation. All right, so I'm in depth again studying the book of Revelation as part of my personal devotional life for the next three months. I mean, it's been good so far. Read it at least three times a week in total, right? Take notes. Do those sort of things. I'll tell you what, it's hard not to get closer to God doing that. It, you, can, you can do that in an academic sense. And when I was in Bible college, they told us it's very easy now to look at the Bible as a textbook and get backslid, and it didn't happen to me. I, buddy, I was close to God when I was in Bible college as I was any, any other time in my life. And, but that first summer after Bible college... That was the time you could backslide, let me tell you. Um, I, I was talking to Don not long ago, and I said, you got to be careful. You know, working in the sound booth and trying to, you can mess around and, and not pay any attention to what's going on, but be paying attention to how the video is going and the sound and all those other things, because I've done that too. I've been backslid in the sound booth. But I can tell you this, I've never studied the Bible and gone backwards spiritually. So that's something we need to add or re-emphasize we want to be closer to God. You want to be closer to God, you, you ought to pray a little bit more than you are now. You, you ought to try to really strengthen your prayer life. Hey, I'm going to pray at every meal, and I'm going to pray in the morning before I get out of bed, and I'm going to pray at night when I lay down, but I'm going to spend some time really praying throughout the day. Hard to backslide when you're talking to God quite a bit. Amen? And, and backsliding, all that is, is as if you're on the, the people mover at the Atlanta airport and you're going opposite the direction it's going, right? Now, if you really are after it and you're taking good long steps and you're moving quickly, you can gain ground going against the current. But if you stop for one moment, you're going backwards in a hurry. And the Christian life is that way. 
if you just try to knock her out of gear for a little while and let it run downhill, you know what will happen? You'll, be, you'll come up on an uphill section before long, and you'll find yourself going backward. I believe you ought, to, you ought to try to witness to people that you don't know throughout your day as you come across them. But if you want to be closer to God, try witnessing to the people you do know. Amen. Everybody in here knows lost people. They know they're lost, and you know they're lost too. You say, yep, those are the hard ones. They sure are, especially when you have a relationship with them as family or friends that predated you living for the Lord. But to witness to people that know you, it'd be hard to backslide while you're doing that because they're going to be paying attention to your life. Be good to have a life that is moving forward by which to have a position or a platform to witness to people that know you. Those are just a few things. Amen. Nothing wrong with devotional books. Nothing wrong with devotional emails. I get two a day. Sometimes I post them. The one is really, really good when it's good, but when they change the words in the Bible, I will not post it. Sometimes I will not forward it. I forward those to my wife and to my daughter. It would be easy for them to subscribe and get them just like I do, but I forward them to them. You say, why do you do that? Hopes they read them. Amen. I know that that devotional stuff is good. Baptist bread is good. I read that every day from my you know, Bible reading, Bible study, and prayer journal, and I <clears throat> sometimes I'll miss a day because I'll be somewhere else or whatever, and I'll try to make that up. But I also do the daily in the word from Paul Chapels, an email they send overnight sometime, every night. The other morning, they wanted to know why I was emailing them at 4 o'clock in the morning. Well, that was why. The Henry Morris one from in, in Institute of Creation Research had already been sent out. They send it out about 3 o'clock every morning. And then later in the morning when the other one came from Brother Chapel, I sent that one forward as well. And sometimes if they're good, I'll post them on the church's Facebook page. But if they are gospel or they have to do with creation or the power of the Bible, I'll post them to my Facebook page too because I know there's a bunch of people that need to come across that and either ignore it on purpose or read some of it. Amen? Because they do both. I, I want there to be a witness in front of other people, and witnessing to people you know will keep you on, on your game spiritually, will force you to try to get closer to God, so you'll have that platform and that position in their life from which to witness to them. But the Lord Jesus Christ over in 2 Corinthians 8, in verse 9, of course, it's Paul writing, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9 tells us here, the Bible says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. The Lord Jesus defines grace, and that's why Paul used him in that one verse synopsis of grace. Grace defines the Lord Jesus Christ and him coming to this earth through the womb of a virgin and, and growing up in a perfect life before his own people. Amen. The Bible says he came unto his own, and he there lived among his own people a perfect and a pristine life before God. When his mom said, know you not that your father and I have been searching for you, he said, know you not that I must be about, he said, wist ye not actually, that I must be about my father's business. And he had talked to doctors and he had talked to lawyers and he grew up in their midst and as one of their own, like that Passover lamb that has to be taken into the house for two full weeks that that perfect lamb without spot or without blemish has to be brought in the house for two full weeks before it is then roasted with bitter herbs. Boy, that might be a tough lamb to eat, amen? But that gives that picture beforehand of the one who came unto his own and his own received him not, amen? They rejected the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul uses him there to define grace that Christ, who was rich, 
but for your sakes became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. That's the definition of grace. But the Lord Jesus Christ delivered grace. The Bible says that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. He, he delivered grace to this world, delivered grace to, the, to his own people, to the surrounding world, and he delivers grace through preserved scripture, through the preaching of the word of God today. Grace is still delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Ghost that there makes appropriation of that grace by bringing conviction upon a, a person's spirit and a person's soul. But he distributes grace. Just like he did in his earthly ministry, he healed the sick. He, he caused the blind to see. He gave hearing to the deaf. He made the lame to walk. He raised the dead, displaying his power. He said in Matthew 28, 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And the liberals like to say that means authority. And bless God, it does. But it also means ability. He doesn't have the authority to do anything that he also does not have the ability to carry out. He's never picked one up that he can't carry off. Amen. He distributes grace to this very hour today. And if, if you would... Here, receive this scripture. You would have to say with me this morning, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I don't know how you might define me, how others might describe me, or, or how they may try to denote me, but I know this, there's good and bad. There's positive and negative, and it is by the grace of God that I am what I am. One of these days, he's going to call my new name that I've never heard before. He's going to say, maybe in general with it, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And I will leave this earth by grace, off of which I have been saved by grace. I will have been prepared by grace, and I'll be delivered by the grace of God to the other shore. Amen. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Like Paul, he says here, I am saved by grace. He was a born-again man in this portion of Scripture. It is recorded for us in Acts chapter 9 where he traveling the Damascus road said it was at the hour of the noon day and I saw a light above the brightness of the sun and I heard a voice speaking with me saying, Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I would be remiss if I didn't in the place of my pastor, Brother Larry Wallace, tell you today, when you speak out against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are persecuting him. You're not just persecuting believers, but you're persecuting him. He said, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And on several occasions, one in length in Acts chapter 25, Paul gave his salvation testimony at the close. He says, it calls upon King Agrippa, and he said, I know you believe. Agrippa said, almost thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. Paul said, I wish that not only thou, but that all that hear my voice were both almost and all together, such as I am this day, saved, forgiven of his sins, put on the right way, serving God, satisfied with it, and headed to be a sacrifice finally. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8, Paul had served God faithfully. But he was saved by grace, first and foremost. If you're here today and you've never been saved, like Jonathan Edwards might have said in his sermon based upon the portion of Scripture that it says, and in due time their foot shall slip. If you're here today and you're lost, the only thing keeping you out of hell at this very moment is one more breath, a little bit of dirt, and the grace of God. If you're lost today by the grace of God, you are what you are. Paul was saved by grace. He had seen the Lord personally. I, I tend to believe that Paul, being a very influential and powerful person, 
would have known about the Lord Jesus Christ even in his earthly ministry. I believe Paul probably passed on every opportunity he ever had to, to hear him at length or to receive him personally. But when he came back to him as that apostle born out of due time and met him on that Damascus road where Paul saw the Lord, Paul could not resist that. He saw the Lord and he, he sensed the love and as a result he saw the light and received Christ as his Savior. Thirdly, he had served the Lord. He served him as a matter of intention. He served him purposefully. He had served him positionally, right? That's what everybody thinks. Well, so-and-so's this. You've got to listen to him. That's positional leadership, and the good news is there are levels above positional leadership. If you have to stress your title to people, it just means that you are still stuck in the positional leadership level. But he had served God powerfully as well. Had a fella trying to listen to him in a window. And as great and commanding a speaker and preacher as Paul was, that fella fell asleep in the window and fell down. And Paul went over there and raised him from the dead. At one point, people had collected things that had touched Paul and, and, and it had possibly his sweat and spittle and who knows what all else on it and, and they took those things and they would send them to people who were ailing and sick and they would get better. They would be healed, if you will. Paul had served the Lord. Paul is a tremendous example as a servant of God. Are you serving the Lord today by grace? I don't mean coming to church. I mean serving the Lord. Amen. Are, are you doing what it is he'd have you to do? Brother Dennis Corll preached a message, and I preach one by the same title, and it's this. Uh, the Bible tells us that we are bought with a price, that we are not our own. And, and the sermon is this. Is God getting all he paid for out of your life? Think about that for a moment. Now, now, you and I, we have all been shown his love. Even if you are lost today, you are yet to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and the free pardon of sin that comes with him and receiving the Holy Ghost of God and having your name written in the Lamb's book of life and sealed by the Holy Ghost of God and headed for heaven and, and, and be put on the right way. You've still been shown his love. You're still alive. There's still a chance. You're sitting under the sound of the gospel this morning. You could be saved today. We have been shown his love, but Paul said also, I'm supposed to be showing it, as well as the fact that I've seen it originally. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 1 for just a moment, where Paul gives an after-the-fact abbreviated version of his testimony. And, and notice with me, how Paul will refer to himself in these verses. 1 Timothy 1, begin with me in verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers mur and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, blessed God which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, put me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. But here's our verse we'll close with. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first... Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Beloved, if you have a copy of 1 Timothy today, the Bible says that Paul is a pattern for us. 
Sometimes we like to pick out some other patterns, but Paul, sure enough, a pattern for us to follow. Amen. He, he's a, uh, the, the right pattern to follow for a whole hog going after the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Not, not just a pork butt portion, which is a shoulder butt, by the way. Not, not just a, not just a, a pork roast or a tenderloin portion or a portion of ribs or, or short ribs or country style or whatever. Not just some pig's feet, right? Anybody here eat pickled pig's feet? But he said he's a whole hog example, an engrafted in sample for us to follow the Apostle Paul. Paul still found himself submitting to others. He spoke out against the high priest, and he did that ignorantly, and, and someone smacked him over it and said, you know, speak us to the high priest thus, and he said, oh, I wish not that that was the Lord's high priest. But then he didn't just smooch up to him, Boy, that's good language, isn't it? That's, that's better than we could say. He didn't just smooch up to him. He turned and put the pressure right on him. By the way, how many remember the day Columbine happened? I believe it was 420, 1999, okay? That night, Larry King had several people on his show, police officers from Columbine or possibly... Uh, some sort of dignitaries from Colorado to speak, and he had Franklin Graham on there. Boy, he thought he put old Franklin Graham on the spot. He said, how can God let things like these happen? And he said something to the effect of, Larry, that is a sin that is in this world and is in mankind. And God offers salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And old Larry let him go. And he said, Larry, with that in mind, what will you do with your sins? And old Larry had to ask for a commercial break out of schedule to put a stop to that. Amen? There's more I could say about that, but I'm not going to. And while Franklin was on there and didn't interrupt, didn't act like it was a, a Jerry Springer show or something of that nature, he submitted to Larry King, but he still turned and put the spotlight on him and said, what about you, Larry? That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. Amen? I'm going to be preaching on the idea of soul winning tonight from uh, Proverbs 11, verses 30 and 31. The Bible says that he that winneth souls is wise not can be wise is wise some folks say well they think that's the measure of christianity is so winning well i don't think it's the measure i believe it's a measure amen it, it must mean something it shows up in the bible quite a bit paul submitted to others as well we know that the song says the lord could have called ten thousand angels Old Paul might have been able to call them too. But in the will of God, when it was time for him to lay down his life, he said, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You realize there are going to be people that are saved, that are going to be frustrated because the Lord calls them out of here when he does. Not everybody's going to love his appearing. Just like we didn't love our dad coming home. Brother Bill mentioned if you had a bad report card, you weren't all that excited for your dad to get home. If you'd got into some kind of mischief or didn't finish mowing the yard or you had back-talked your mom in a way that she was not going to let slide. You weren't all that excited about your dad coming home. And if we're not engaged in the Christian life, if we're not engaged and in gear and intentionally following the Lord Jesus Christ, we may not be all that glad when he does come. But every one of us must say today, by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
If you're here today and you're a sinner, you are what you are by the grace of God. You may be successful. You may have material wealth. You may have a good family. You might have a good heritage and a good name that you got from your father. You might live in a nice home, but without the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says you're headed for torment. You've been given a tremendous opportunity today. By the grace of God, not only are you what you are, but you are where you are as well. And by the grace of God today, God has you this, under the sound of the preaching of the gospel. Don't frustrate the grace of God. Don't grieve the Spirit of God by saying no to His Spirit if He calls you unto salvation this very day. Because I guarantee you he will. If you're here and he's lost, he will call to you. He will knock on the door of your heart and you will feel thrumming on your heartstrings that maybe you have never felt before. Don't deny it. Don't quench the spirit. Grieve not the spirit of God, but respond to the spirit of God pleading with you and step forward, be honest enough, in just a very few minutes to say, Preacher, I need to be saved. Preacher, I need to know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven. By the way, God doesn't just save you to go to heaven. He saves you to go to heaven so you can be with him. And he saves you and leaves you here so that you can serve him in this life. Not just to wait, but to occupy. There's a difference in those words, isn't there? Jews know that there's a difference in waiting around and being occupied. If you're a saint today... You are what you are by the grace of God. You're saved by the grace of God. You're, you're sanctified and being sanctified by the grace of God. You have the spirit of God by the grace of God. You're able to sing the hymns of the faith. You're able to say amen. You're able to say I am saved by the grace of God. If you're serving today, understand this. It doesn't matter how many medals and pins you may one day have on the garment that is your home in heaven. If this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God made without hands in the heavens. Amen? It says being clothed upon. No matter how many medals or records or accomplishments you have, it will be purely by the grace of God. If God would call us to be a sacrifice, because you understand now, coronavirus in America has shown one thing, persecution's not coming. It has begun. And it has begun at the house of God. Not everywhere, thank God. I'm glad I don't live in California. I'm glad I don't live in New Mexico. I'm glad I don't live in Michigan, praise God. Hey, I say about Michigan what I've always said about Georgia. It's a good place to be from, but it ain't no place to be. Amen. I, I'm, I'm glad to be in a state and, and to certainly be under a sheriff that does not try to persecute the church of the living God. But that could change easy enough, couldn't it? Matter of fact, the real change has happened in this country in the last two election cycles in the Senate, in the House, in governorships, and so on. But every one of us can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. If they came in here today and tried to shoot the preacher and God wanted me to be a, a dead sacrifice, then that'd just be what it'd be. He'd have to convince me ahead of time to make sure I didn't put up a fight. Amen? Because I might. I'm just raised that way. You know what I mean? It's just I've, I'm, I'm not a redneck, but I got some redneck ways. Amen? And I... My fight or flight response is set on fight. It's stuck on fight, amen, unless it's a rattlesnake or a bear, and then you're going to see me run as fast as I can, amen. I don't know how fast I can because I've never been chased yet. If he would call on us to be a sacrifice, do you understand the Bible says about those apostles that they praised him? Because they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. It would be our pleasure. It would be by the grace of God if God allowed us to suffer for him. 
And we've been given quite a testimony of those men like Richard Warmbrand and others who had suffered. Fox's Book of Martyrs is full of them. I've heard about the families that the communists came in and took their babies from their mother's arms and threw them in the air and caught them on bayonets. What? That wasn't a big change. That happened in a really short period of time. And it could happen here. I don't know about you, but I kind of hope it doesn't. But if it does, whatever God lets us live out will be by his grace. But more than anything else in this world, by the grace of God, it is good to be able to say that I know I am his and that he is mine, that I am saved by grace, that I've been set apart initially and I am being set apart progressively and he allows me to serve him and if he might... I will suffer for him. If I need be, I will be a sacrifice for him, even though I'm supposed to be a living sacrifice now. We would have to praise him by his grace if we were counted worthy to suffer for his name. But today, if you've never been saved by the grace of God, make today the day. Don't miss your chance. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, the Bible says in Proverbs 27, 1, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. By the grace of God, you are what you are right now. But by the grace of God, you can be what God wants you to be one moment from now. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the word of God and the opportunity to preach it one more time. someone coming to receive Christ as Savior for the very first time to make a new business of God. Be it saved here in our midst today. Father, would you during this invitation time place upon us an emphasis upon the idea of being everything we should be for you. Lord, we ought to be serving you in a local church. We ought to be sold out in that. Help us each and every one to surrender whatever you have us to so that we might be exactly what you have us be. Lord, if we will be what we're supposed to be, we won't have any problem doing what we're supposed to do. Bless in these moments the quiet and affection and invitation we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.